you will hear a number of different recordings, and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. Section 1. You will hear a telephone conversation between a woman who works at a campsite and a man who wants information about staying there. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. You will see that there is an example that has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Hello, this is Littlethorpe Campsite. Good afternoon. I'd like to ask about staying with you. Certainly. How can I help? Well, we were thinking about coming for the bank holiday weekend at the end of May. The man is thinking of staying at the campsite during a bank holiday weekend at the end of May. So, May has been written in the space. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Hello, this is Littlethorpe Campsite. Good afternoon. I'd like to ask about staying with you. Certainly. How can I help? Well, we were thinking about coming for the bank holiday weekend at the end of May. Right. We still have some vacancies, although I should warn you, it's one of our busiest weekends of the year, so the last places will go quickly. Also, because that weekend is so popular... We only let people book if they are going to stay for at least three nights, Friday to Sunday. Oh, OK. Well, we were planning to stay just two nights on Friday and Saturday, but we can extend our holiday. That will be fine. OK, that's great. Can you tell me a bit about the campsite? Sure. We've been running the site for nearly 30 years now. It's located near Littlethorpe. That's a beautiful village and it's well known for having an award-winning restaurant. I recommend trying it if you can. The village is a 10-minute walk from us. The campsite's in an area of outstanding natural beauty. People often come here for walking and there are beautiful lakes nearby if you prefer sailing. Are there other things to do nearby? Well, if you're interested in history, there's a castle just down the road that has a very interesting past. That sounds great. And can you tell me about the facilities you provide? Of course. We've got everything you'd expect a small campsite to have. There are toilets and showers... And we have a sink where campers can clean their cooking things and which also provides drinking water. We've got a little shop where you can buy basic supplies, things like bread, milk and eggs. We also serve freshly made coffee. What about using electronic devices? Is there Wi-Fi anywhere on the site? We've got a lounge which has comfortable sofas and a huge TV if you want to watch a film. But to use our free Wi-Fi, you'll have to go to the reception building and you can also charge your phone there whenever you need to. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen 
and answer questions 6 to 10. Do you put on any entertainment? Not really. We're not like some of the larger campsites that have a band or a show on every evening. We're a small site and we like to keep things peaceful. Having said that, we have a fantastic children's playground and we've got a pretty good collection of games which are free for anyone to borrow during their stay. So, can you tell me what it's like to camp there? Sure. We have two main areas. Most people camp in the main part of the site. That's the open grassy area near the car park, which is popular because there's plenty of space and it's near our other facilities. There's another place for camping set in a forest, which is much smaller. It's beautiful though. In spring there are flowers everywhere and you wake up to the sound of birds every morning. It sounds amazing. So how much does it cost to stay? It's £18 a night. Oh, no, sorry. That was last year's price. It's gone up to £20 this year. In high season, the price goes up to £25. But that happens in June, so it won't affect you. OK, that's fine. I should mention that we don't allow dogs at the campsite now, as we've had a few problems there. We don't have a dog, but I was wondering if we'd be allowed to make a fire outside our tent. Just in the evenings, probably. Yes, that's absolutely fine. But we do ask that you use the fire pits that we provide to minimise any harm to the grass and don't leave them unattended overnight. Well, I suppose I should buy a tent now. Do you have any recommendations? Sure. I suggest looking at camping websites and checking out the reviews. How many of you are coming? There'll be three of us. Two adults and a child. Well, I recommend you get a five-person tent. The most important thing is to get one that's going to have enough space for you and all your things. I think it's better to pay a bit more if you can afford to, as it's no fun to be stuck in a tent that's too small. Can I give you any other information? I think that's everything. Thanks. I'm looking forward to coming. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 2. You will hear the director of a university's career service telling students about an internship fair. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. Good morning. My name's Laura and I'm the director of the University Career Service. Today I'll be talking about an event that we'll be holding next week, which is an internship fair. The aim of this session is to give you some background information that will help you make the most of the event. 
To begin with, let's think about what an internship is. It's essentially a form of work placement, lasting from as little as one week to as much as a year. Many of the internships on offer at the fair are for summer jobs, but there are some other placements suitable for when people finish their studies. Obviously, you can benefit from doing an internship in a large number of ways. Perhaps the most obvious advantage is that it's an opportunity to spend time and participate in a real working environment, hugely important at this stage in your professional careers. The other major advantage is that an internship can be a great route into getting a permanent job with an organisation. If an employer is impressed by an intern's performance, then they may recruit him or her. It makes sense, as the organisation knows the person they are hiring can do the work, and it also saves on recruitment costs. So, what's the best way of getting an internship that works for you? I'd suggest that you should start with your CV. You want your CV to stand out, but I would recommend using one of the many templates you can find online. It's the information that needs to catch employers' eyes rather than the layout, and the standard designs are generally effective. You need to make sure that your CV contains the latest information, particularly regarding your academic achievements and any work you have done so far. You should also try to make sure that your CV is tailored to the internship you are applying for. You need to draw the reader's attention to your expertise and background in areas that are applicable to the organisation's work. Personally, I wouldn't bother with including details about what you do in your free time, as it's not usually relevant in my view. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. OK, so what can you do to make sure that you get the most from next week's internship fair? There are a few do's and don'ts that you should bear in mind. Nowadays, many people use networking sites for accessing job opportunities. These sites are often the first place that recruiters look when hiring new employees, so it's a good idea to create your own profile and provide plenty of detail. You want to make sure that potential employers can find all the information that they need. You should all have a guide to next week's event. This lists all the organisations that are coming and provides information about the internships that they are offering. It would be an excellent idea to check out the organisations that you are considering applying to. This will show that you are serious about working for them and they will be impressed by your keenness. Perhaps the most useful piece of advice I can give is to just go out and speak to different organisations. Having said that, an unfocused approach in which you try to speak to representatives of every organisation at the fair and apply for dozens of internships is not recommended. We suggest that you plan ahead. Think about who you want to approach and just target those people. This will make your search for the perfect internship more focused. If you're not sure about the kind of internship that would be most suitable for you, why not come along to talk to us at the Careers Service Stand? We'll be happy to advise you if we can. Please note 
that we expect a lot of demand, so we can only help people that book an appointment in advance. You can do this on the Career Service website. When you speak to recruiters, it's a good idea to try and find out as much as possible about the organisations that they represent, rather than just saying what you want. So, at this early stage in the process, we suggest you find out about what the organisation does and what the internship entails, rather than asking questions about holiday entitlement, employee benefits and pay. It's also important to try and show interest and enthusiasm for the organisation's work. You want the recruiter to see you as a potential colleague and someone that is keen to learn and do a good job. It's also a very good idea to contact any recruiters you have spoken to a few days after the fair in order to show your interest in the internships they are offering. Probably the best way of doing this is by email. OK, does anyone have any questions at this stage? That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 3. You will hear two geography students called Jasmine and Carl discussing their presentation on flooding, following instructions from their tutor. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Hello, Carl and Jasmine. I've asked you here to talk about the presentation you're going to give on flooding. You should have done enough research and be ready to start planning now. Hello, Dr Barker. Yes, I think we're ready. How do you think we ought to begin the presentation, Jasmine? Well... We could use a picture to illustrate our main point, that flooding is becoming a more serious issue. That might be a good way to get people's attention. Hmm, so a photo. Or we could present some data in the form of a graph, perhaps. Yes, although I've also been thinking we could show a short video of last year's flood in Westcliff. But actually, I think a graph will be best we can show the rising cost of damage over the years. I agree. Perhaps we could divide the presentation into three main parts. In the first part, we can talk about the causes of flooding, then give a summary of the effects before moving on to discuss flood prevention. Right. I think the causes of flooding in this country are well known, although... I was interested to read just how much impact things like building on floodplains and cutting down trees have. Yes, but one thing that amazed me was the effect of soil becoming compacted by farmers using heavy machinery or when too many animals graze on farms. Yes, I hadn't realised the significance of that either. Now, I think we need to give some information specifically about coastal flooding – we could mention thunderstorms here? Well, I know that a variety of factors contribute to coastal flooding, including long periods of heavy rain. 
but I think we can just explain that the most extreme conditions generally take place when high tides occur at the same time as windy weather that blows water on shore. That's what produces the most severe flooding. Right. Just focusing on the main cause of coastal flooding sounds like a good idea, so we don't run out of time. Let's think about the effects of flooding. Right. There are a number of things we can list. The most obvious consequences are negative, such as endangering life and causing injuries. I find it interesting that people tend to overlook the effect of flooding on the world around us, like destroying animals' habitats and causing pollution if oil or dangerous chemicals leak into the water. Well, I think people are aware of those consequences. But what's often missed is the financial impact, the cost to flood damaged homes, businesses, and farmland, and damage caused to infrastructure such as roads and bridges. Hmm, that's a really good point, and you're right that it doesn't get enough focus. But we also need to remember that there are positive effects of flooding too, and it'd be good to mention that in our presentation. Good idea. We could mention that rivers spilling over onto floodplains often carry silt, which improves the quality of farmers' soil and makes land more fertile. Right, and floodwaters often used for irrigation, of course. Although perhaps that's not really worth highlighting. Another effect is groundwater recharge. It's when floodwater replenishes the water table. And this is important as it stops sources of water that people rely on, such as wells and springs, from drying up. Shall we include that? Actually, I think it would be good to mention the improvement to the quality of land for growing produce. That's the most interesting positive effect, I think. Okay. Before you hear the rest of the discussion. You have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty. Now listen. And answer questions twenty-six to thirty. So, in the final part of your presentation, you ought to discuss some of the things that can be done to reduce flooding. Right, construction could be one area to focus on. I know that buildings with green roofs are becoming more popular. These are roofs that are covered with vegetation, which absorbs rainwater. There are some issues with green roofs, though. They need special waterproof materials to make sure water and plant roots don't damage the buildings. That's a good example. We also need to talk about measures taken to prevent coastal flooding, such as sea walls and sand dunes, where sand is piled up to create mounds. These protect low-lying areas from flooding from the sea and are generally effective. But they're huge infrastructure projects, so they're often extremely expensive. And we also need to discuss river management techniques. Flooding can be reduced by making rivers wider or deeper, so they can carry a greater volume of water during periods of high rainfall. This works well, but it may change the way a landscape looks and can damage the ecology of the river. So some of the approaches that require large amounts of construction are described as hard engineering solutions, but soft engineering approaches to flooding can be effective. One example I read about was putting small barriers, such as tree trunks, across ditches in fields to divert water away from rivers and into open land. These kinds of technique can't stop flooding, but will help people to cope with it. That's interesting, and finally, there are solutions that can be deployed as a last resort, like temporary flood barriers. 
These can be added on top of existing flood protection, such as embankments, to provide protection from severe floods, so people might use these if it looks as though flood defences might not work. Temporary flood barriers can be installed in front of doors, for example. This kind of flood protection equipment can be bought from DIY stores, but unfortunately it's not easy to install effectively. OK. Well, I think you've got plenty to talk about. That is the end of section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 4. You will hear a student giving a presentation about a style of architecture called brutalism. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Hello and welcome to my presentation. I'm going to talk today about a particular style of architecture which is known as brutalism. Let's start by looking at the origins of brutalist architecture. One of the first examples was a large housing complex designed by an architect called Le Corbusier. The building, completed in France in 1952, was big enough to house 1,600 people. It is now considered by many to be the most influential brutalist building ever designed. Around the same time, two married architects called Alison and Peter Smithson designed a school that was built in Norfolk in England. They described it as brutalist, but it's the renowned architectural critic and historian Rainer Bannum who is credited with bringing the name and the concept of brutalism into prominence. He wrote an essay with the title The New Brutalism, which was published in 1955. Throughout the 50s and 60s, the movement gained momentum, becoming more and more popular with designers. The peak of its popularity was in the 70s, with many examples in Eastern European countries and also in the UK and the USA. So, what are the main features of brutalism? It was a rejection of the decorative elements seen in preceding styles of architecture and represented a cheaper, plainer design. In terms of materials, brutalism is most closely associated with concrete, but the buildings are also typically constructed using large amounts of steel. These materials were not only inexpensive, but they also meant that building projects could be completed quickly. One common characteristic of brutalism is to deliberately expose some of the essential parts of a building, which, in most other styles of architecture, would be hidden away. 
For example, many brutalist constructions were designed with pipes on the outside of the building for all to see. Another feature of brutalist architecture is rough and unfinished surfaces. So materials were often left in their raw form, emphasizing their basic and most natural state. In addition, structures tend to be large, creating an imposing sense of scale. And brutalist designers delighted in using striking and memorable shapes in their constructions, which looked different from the norm. With buildings sometimes appearing to have been built upside down, these features all helped to generate a powerful image. At its height in the 60s and 70s, designers used brutalism to connect architecture with the realities of modern life as they saw it. The style tended to be particularly popular in institutional buildings. As well as social housing, these also include churches, such as the stunning Ronchamp Chapel designed by Le Corbusier, theatres like London's Barbican Centre and National Theatre, and libraries such as the enormous Geisel Building in San Diego, California. During the 1980s, brutalist architecture began to decline in popularity, and there were a few reasons for this. One was the cold, hard appearance of the buildings, which people started to see as ugly. But another significant reason was the changing appearance of raw concrete over time. Years of exposure led to damage, which could be clearly seen on the exterior of buildings. This meant that brutalism started to be seen as a symbol of poverty or hardship. In Portsmouth, on the south coast of the UK, a brutalist shopping centre and car park was frequently described by locals as ugly, and in one radio poll, listeners voted it the most hated UK building. It was eventually demolished, as were many other brutalist buildings. Other styles of architecture took over, such as postmodernism. This was a reaction against brutalism, involving very different features, such as bright colors, complexity, and humor. However, in recent years, brutalism has started to see a return to favor. Brutalist architecture has featured in 21st century pop culture. Including music videos and films, bringing it back into fashion, and there have been museum exhibits reviving the style. Evidence of its rise could be clearly seen in 2016, when five separate books on the subject were published. Another key to its revival is social media. Where a new generation has enjoyed posting and tagging photos of buildings in brutalist style, and although some constructions were demolished several years ago, other surviving buildings are being revived and repurposed. A huge block of housing in Rome, known as the Big Snake, is being developed into modern houses with a public space. Meanwhile, in Sheffield, in England, a housing estate built in the 60s has recently been listed in the top 20 coolest places to live in the UK. There are newly developed apartments alongside accommodation for university students, and cultural projects such as the largest gallery in the area. The aim is to create a mixed and lively community. So it seems that brutalism is truly back. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
That is the end of the listening test.